Hey, welcome back, everybody. Of course, you know me. This is Dr. Keith McNally, and this is the Question Guy Podcast. I'm here with the Super Kate, and that's all we're going to give you because this woman is awesome. Super Kate, how are you doing today? I'm great, actually. How are you? How is everyone out there in the the universe of the the tube and the podcast world? Hello. I, I think uh, the the podcasting world is is flourishing. I really think so, and I know that my conversations are typically pretty awesome. Um, at the very least, I try to make them that way, and I'm getting the feedback that they are in whatever space that is, because everybody comes to the story or to the conversation with their own story of interest, intrigue, and impact. And so I really want to get into your story today because kind of like me, I was always a misfit growing up. I was never like the person that fit into a crowd, right? Um, I'm short. I'm not athletic. Wasn't necessarily good looking either. I kind of grew into that and I'll take credit for that. Um, As I got older, but I was, you know, always kind of not part of the crowd. And that's kind of part of your story as well, as I understand it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I had a very different, I mean, I would like to think I'm also growing into my looks too. Um, I have no opinion about what I looked like as a kid, but I was an athlete from the age of five, actually, swimming, started playing basketball as soon as I could, did soccer, did tennis, did track, volleyball, like all the stuff. I was constantly involved in the sports, pretty good student. And even so much as like varsity, like lettering my freshman year of high school, like I was a, I was really up there and yet it was not what I was. And I think many people think of as like the typical, oh, you're the athlete, so you must be popular. And I was just not a popular kid. I had some people I hung out with, but, you know, I just, it was, I had some stuff happen and I was not treated well. And it was really rough, especially so much that I ended up leaving school early. Yeah. Well, are you able or you feel comfortable enough to talk about maybe some of the situations that you found yourself in? Because I think if our audience, those who are listening, can kind of, you know, relate to that, I think they'd feel better. Yeah, absolutely. So I, be, growing up in a small town, I kind of did what I thought I was supposed to do as far as dress the way everybody kind of else dressed do my hair, you know, all that kind of stuff. The jacket that was really popular at the time, get that jacket. Uh, And for the most part, I feel like I kept up with that stuff. Um, But there was just a general underlying, it's not enough. And so when I started having these inklings of like, well, this is not actually who I am, And I want to try to lean in a little more to the things that I like. I knew that that was going to be very divisive. Now, good and bad, this was before the internet. So So in, (laughs) this was back in the, you know, the eighties when like we, we couldn't see other possibilities unless they were on TV or we happen to hear somebody talking about it on the radio. Yes, the radio before podcasts. Um, (laughs) So I couldn't reference TikTok for like, oh, there are other people out there like me. I just felt pretty alone. I saw a couple other people um, who were ostracized even more so because they liked art. They were in art class. And when, you know, where I grew up, that was just, you don't sign up for art class and you re- unless you really want to be like on the outside. And looking back, I'm just, all of my friends are artists now. Like how could I not want to be around artists? That's just, it baffles me, but that was where I grew up. And it was a very, uh, there's a lot of 
Christianity. And if you had any views other than Christianity and not to the degree that it is now, but if you, if you weren't sure if there was a God, don't let anybody else know. So you just didn't talk about stuff. And it was, it was very lonely, but I was very fortunate because my parents had spent many years traveling. They, they went to schools in different states. They traveled all around the world. And so I had pictures of, um, of Africa and the Middle East, like in, in our house growing up. And there was just this general sense of there's a bigger world out there. There are more opportunities. And that really filled me as far as I knew from a very young age that I was going to leave this town and there were other places to go. So when it got tough, even in the super tough times when I, you know, when people didn't show up for a party that I had invited them to, or I was turned down for things, you know, hangouts, dates, whatever it was, that I I knew it was just a matter of time. Now, of course, a lot of that was like, there was a lot of little kid ego back then too, of like, I'm going to show them, right? <laughs> and But that helps us. That's part of the growth process. And it did get me out of there. And I'm very grateful because as a result of a very frustrating point when I was in high school and I decided I'm going to, I was really upset because I had been turned down for prom. Now I had asked the guy, I'd gotten the nerves to ask the guy. And then after saying yes, then he said he couldn't. I found out later why he couldn't, which was basically his brother who was in my class told him not to. Oh. So I was like, wow, what do these people really think of me? Like, why, <laughs> what have I done? I feel like I have been a great, you know, athlete with them. I feel like I've been nice. And that was just something wasn't, maybe it was because I knew there was something else out there. I, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but at that moment, when I just couldn't see any future and not in a, I wasn't too far gone as far as like, I wasn't, I wasn't personally contemplating anything, but I was like, I just don't know how to get out of this. And my parents said, Hey, there are other opportunities out there. Let's figure that out. Would you like to be an exchange student? I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I know we've had them, but what do you mean leave? They're like, yeah, you could leave. And they it's not that they wanted me to go, but they also understood that it was not going to be a safe space for me to be in for another year. Hmm. So I jumped at the opportunity, even though I was very late in the game to jump at that opportunity. So for and your senior year of high school? Yeah, my senior year of high school, I spent the whole year in Japan, in Tokyo, basically, which coming from a town of about 4,000 people to Tokyo was actually like the coolest thing I could have ever imagined. Now, most people even now don't even can't even wrap their heads around Tokyo, but I knew I had to live in a big city. Wow. I knew it. And I knew that. No, even though I haven't hadn't seen very much about Tokyo, I knew that that was like the future. And so when I had the opportunity to sort of um, pick which countries were in my top favorite, mm. Japan was my top favorite. Now, I could have landed anywhere in Japan. I could have landed in, you know, Okinawa or a small town on the west coast of Japan, but the universe, the world, however, you know, whatever you believe in said, no, you're going to Tokyo. 
let's take some steps back a little bit because yeah. you mentioned something about you knew you were different, but I like to say you knew you were unique and you were becoming comfortable with that uniqueness from, I'm not sure what age, but at some point in all of this turmoil and chaos that was your younger life, you were actually kind of doing a bit more reflection and introspection than probably many young people do in that time period because most of it is you know, friends and activities and school and all that encompasses, you were doing something different. You were going on your own personal journey. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that was like? What was it like finding out and being more comfortable with you? I think one of the first things that I leaned into was clothing. I mean, at the time it was primarily JC Penney was our her option. We could go to this, you know, the mall, right. but that JC Penney was primarily what we purchased from. But I knew that like I didn't, I wasn't a skirt girl at the time, at least at what was represented as what was skirts. And I knew what I liked and what I was attracted to. Now, as I got older, I began to understand what I'm attracted to isn't necessarily what I find attractive on my body. But I was like, oh, I'm attracted to that, that style. So on, you know, on music, um, on music videos, on MTV, back when they played music videos, I would see like the, the skateboarders with the bigger pants. And this was, you know, getting into the grunge era. And so there was like the flannel and there was just something in me that was like that, that is really cool. I really like that. And of course, music plays a lot into that because that was, I mean, I, I grew up in a very musical household, so you could definitely, as far as your brain is concerned, tie these good feelings of music and these images, all of that coming together in a, oh, if I like this music and these are the images, chances are I'm going to like what they're wearing and everything in the videos. So I started putting, I started getting little bits of those things. So like, I remember my first flannel shirt. And it was, I was very lucky. I, I got a flannel shirt from J crew. Now a grunge, <laughs> a grunge person, person might say a J crew flannel, but it was a present. And I, like, I still remember I have pictures of myself in it and it felt right over a t-shirt. Like it just felt right. And the pants and I like the slightly looser pants and my I, I wasn't looking quite as female as, as many of my other classmates were, but once I was in those clothes, I, I didn't care. I didn't care because this was, this was an outward view. This is how I felt to the world. Mm -hmm. And that was more important to me leaning into what I needed to present as than presenting female or male or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, um, the options for like, I can't even imagine what I would do now if I was growing up in this era of like, you actually can. And I know I could have technically dressed however I wanted, if it meant wearing my grandma's sweater and I don't know, my dad's boots and some hot pink shorts or something. I could have technically done that when I was growing up, but there was a certain degree to which I understood. I like I was just mentally bullied, talked about all that kind of stuff. Let's stop. We had a technical hiccup Yeah. Um, for about 20 seconds. So go back 20 seconds. You were being bullied. And so 
let's pick up the conversation there. Let me restart and I'll just edit this out in the, in the context yeah. of it. So you can dress any way you want it. Ta start there. Yeah. So I could have dressed any way I wanted, but at the time I only wanted to push or even had the inkling of what pushing those boundaries meant. And so I knew to push it X far because if I went farther than that, then I would probably be physically bullied as well as the mental bullying that was already happening. So I chose to only push the bar so far. Now, when I started doing my hair differently, because back then and still today, I am, I'm a blonde, but I never really like that just was, I, I lost that part of like connection very early on in my life. Kind of when I stopped being a lifeguard, I no longer cared about being a blonde. Okay. So, <laughs> and so when I started doing my hair the way I wanted, I was like, oh, this is really cool. And it just was these little steps that reaffirmed within me, this is, I'm, this is still okay. I'm still here. I'm still able to make these choices mm -hmm. and it feels better. And with each step, even though it meant m more people not talking to me, it just reaffirmed that me being myself was more important because then again, I would come back to that whole worldview. Doesn't matter if they don't like me somebody out there is going to like me and I'll do what I want to do because that is more important than leaning into this life of what's going to make them happy. And so there's this little rebel side in me that, I mean, I'm still very much a people pleaser in many ways, but there's enough of a rebel that needed to be heard and seen. So, so yeah. when you got to, Japan, your world changed, I think, probably forever. Um, and yeah. there's that smile that, that we <laughs> are so accustomed to seeing on you. Talk to us about how that really opened up your world. What was it like? Well, yeah. Well, what's funny is here I am being this like rebel in my little town, but I go to Japan where you can't really be a rebel at all. <laughs> and I went to a school where I couldn't dye my hair. I had to wear the school uniform, just like in most schools in Japan at the time. So it was, it was somehow it didn't bother me too much though, because everybody was doing it. That was part of society. And so I was, I was okay with that. Um, but probably in that I was the rebel being the only American at my school. So I had no training in Japanese leading up to this. Never studied a lick of it. <laughs> that, and that, that the language, the customs or anything? I knew there was some bowing involved. That's about as much as I knew going into it. Okay. And yeah, and I was very lucky. So I went through the Rotary Exchange Program. Before we get, what year was this? This was? This was 95 to 96. Okay. All right. Just give yeah. a reference. All right. Yeah, absolutely. And when, so with the Rotary Exchange Program, it's really awesome because they try to like keep all of the, all the exchange students connected with the other exchange students in the conferences that are closest to them. Okay. So I was assigned to one specific conference and then there were other, other kids in Tokyo with me. So when we first arrived, they sent us to a Japanese learning school for, I mean, maybe it was a month. It, I don't remember it being that long, but it could have been a month. Um, and we learned very basic phrasing, a little bit of writing. And then we were sent off to the schools that we were assigned to. And I had a very different experience than all of my friends. In that, I went to a school that did not meet the, 
the stereotype of what most people have of Japan. Now, most people, myself included, thought, oh, I'm going to be going to the school and they're going to be doing like high level calculus and all kinds of stuff. And I'm not going to understand anything aside from like just not understanding the language. But I went to a school that we were doing fractions in high school. We were doing very basic science classes. And I only know this mostly from the pictures that I was looking at because <laughs> while all of my other fellow exchange students were being sent to um, Japanese lessons and learning very specific things about Japanese culture, like green tea ceremonies and different instruments or different martial arts or something. Mm -hmm. I actually went to a school where I took every single class with my classmates without having any Japanese training. And I just sat there and listened <laughs> during class. This is before we had cell phones. It's before they had pagers, but like I didn't have any means of passing time other than just sitting there and attempting to glean some kind of Japanese out of it. Right. And so my, my training in Japanese really came from listening to people, watching television, having an occasional lesson every few weeks, every other month or something. And then my very lovely patient friends at school who would really try to like break down things and speak the very, very little English that they spoke. Mm -hmm. But the thing that stood out about my high school is a lot of famous kids went there. So still to this day, if I say I went to Horikoshi, they're like, oh my gosh, that's where you went? So-and-so went there and so-and-so. And I'm like, yeah, I have pictures from the days when I was there with these famous kids. Wow. But yeah, I mean, you could maybe say that's where my years in the entertainment industry started. <laughs> <laughs> There's like this weird through line through my life, but it was still, I was very accepted there. Now, you know, I'm an American. American at the time was very fashionable, but I was, I'm six feet tall. So I didn't mix in at all. Unlike some of my friends who were five, two, five, three, but it was, it was such a, like, I just felt I could, even though it was the, one of the biggest cities on earth, I felt I could breathe there. I felt possibility. I felt that there was a, this undercurrent that, you know, for good and bad doesn't exist in small town life. And, um, yeah, the, the sense of we are living in the future, even though it really wasn't that far beyond, if at all, than what I grew up with, but the big tall buildings and all of the food and all of these crazy choices I could make any day and being in it with everyone, it felt like a whole different family, um, even though I looked nothing like them. And so then that in its own way reaffirmed that I can be unique and I can have my own voice and look the way I do but still experience things and this world, however, feels best to me. Well, let's talk about for a little bit. How did that then open up your world? You were now immersed in something different. You now appreciate it more, you, your uniqueness and who you were. Now you get the opportunity to live the life you want to live. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. And I did... The, you know, the best I could at that point within the, you know, within the structure that Japan allowed and my families and my school allowed. And I knew then, because that was my senior year, okay, I get to, I have to start making some choices for colleges now. And I was very set on certain things, but I, 
I had always had this inkling of working in theater, but again, that was the arts. So I didn't talk about it a whole lot as I was growing up. I just, but to my parents, I did. I was like, I want to be involved in theater somehow. I don't know what that means, but I just, I want to do it. And they very much nurtured that. We went to plays and musicals in St. Louis and some other cities to keep that passion alive in me. Um, and I saw some plays in Kabuki and Kabuki and no theater when I was in Japan. It wasn't exactly what I, like the style that I wanted to go into, but I really appreciated that I had the opportunity to see those very traditionally rich practices in person. Mm-hmm. And so then I knew, okay, well, Japan is very much a part of me and I have to take that with me. So I want to go somewhere that includes Japanese, but I also need to prioritize my theater now. So we went through a bunch of, you know, schools, there were rejections and one specifically really stung, but looking back, I'm like, no, whatever you want to call it again, universe, God, whatever luck, got me to exactly where I needed to be. And so I ended up at a school that was um, University of Oregon, go Ducks, (laughs) as if I ever watch a game, but yeah. So um, we, but we, I had the opportunity to continue studying Japanese, to be in an environment where there was an Asian population still, which is the Pacific, you know, the West coast and the Pacific Northwest. But then it being a state school, I was able to really lean into the theater program um, in a way that at some of the higher higher education Ivy League places, I wouldn't have had as many opportunities early on. And it was, I, I connected with some of the most amazing people very early on there. And that just it expanded me, but I, I really was like, this is, I, I need this. So how can I make this happen? And I, I think that we often, society often tells us that we have to really lean into what everybody else needs and take care of everybody. Um, and you don't want to rock the boat, all that kind of stuff. And we really, even though we are a very uh, individualistic society here in the U.S., they only want you to be an individual so much because it really is about everybody else. You have to make everybody else happy. And so when you start hearing those little things those little nudges of, but I really like this. And leaning into that, even if you need to do it by yourself, you know, or, or you find, you know, you want to just like do a Google search or something like, what is it that you find exciting? And there are going to be other people out there who you can connect with on that who aren't going to shame you, who are not going to disrespect you. Like I lose respect for you because of that. Like that's there. We are such incredible creatures and we have these brains that have so many opportunities and will continue as we get smarter and smarter and evolve. Why not? lean into that and figure it out because we do have this one life. Even if you believe in more lives right now, this is your one life. And so to lean into that while at the same time, respecting that other people are going to have their beliefs and their lives and their wants and their needs. And that isn't a specific reflection on you as to you being bad because you don't fall in line with them. They don't like you because of. We have a lot 
of, we just have a lot and we're all just trying to get through it. So, yeah. I want to end this beautiful conversation with one last question because you've gone through a lot. You've explored how to tap in to who you are, your uniqueness, and you have the most unique name and everybody <laughs> in my audience is wondering, Dr. K, why did you call her Super K? Other than the fact that it's written in Zoom. <laughs> tell me, tell us, All right. where did Super K come from? And why yeah, do you claim so, that as you? <laughs> so I grew up with a name that was very hard to pronounce. My parents never meant for it to be the name that was I was called by. They just wanted a version of Kate. And so I always grew up with Kate. And being an athlete, of course, everybody's got a nickname or they're being called by their last name, you know, like Johnson or I don't know, whatever. Like it's often, it's like a, it's a term of endearment often to have a nickname. Huh? Most, I mean, I know there's a lot of nicknames out there that are not terms of endearment and they're no, but yeah, that's how, awful. That's but how we relate to each other. Yeah. 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 And I just never felt that because I was always Kate and never Katie. That's fine. I choose, I am not a Katie. Um, but yeah, it, so I was in college and my best friend at the time had 12 different nicknames. And I couldn't believe that I what? knew somebody who had 12 nicknames. I thought that was crazy and amazing. Well, and you only need one. Right. And I was so envious, but she had like, it seemed like every other one of her friends had a different nickname for her, even though her name was so cool. Like first and last name, just so cool. Oh, well, then, if and, it's cool, you got, what, 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 what was it? What is it? Oh, uh, what is it? What's her name? Oh, her name is Dominique Dragoon. And it just, yeah, it was, I just thought it was the coolest name, but yet every other name, just everybody had different names for her. And so finally we were road tripping back from San Francisco, spring break of freshman year. And I just, I was, I'm like, screw it. I want a nickname. I don't care if this is not how they come about. I want a nickname. And she said, well, what, what theme do you want? And then recalling like, oh, she does have different themes. <sighs> well, sh I, I want a, a superhero nickname. And so she thought about it for about an hour. She's like, I just, I keep coming back to super Kate. And, and I was like, all right. Well, I wish this had come about some other way, like somebody randomly calls me this, but this is just who I am now. And so then, I mean, it took a few months for me to start introducing myself as that, because of course I'm still a freshman in college and establishing myself in this new world, but Isn't by sophomore year. Responsibility? <laughs> <laughs> this is my friend, Super Kate. You can't like introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Sue. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> It's got. Well, it's got to. You got to have that that influence around you. Yeah, and and it was interesting because there were a couple other people. Even that after I had said no, I'm super Kate now. Other people in the theater department would try to come up with other nicknames for me, and they just never stuck. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, this is clear. Like I am super Kate. I am super Kate. Now I have to live up to it, which is, you know very easy some days, very hard and frustrating other days, um, both because I think I'm supposed to present to the world as super Kate a hundred percent of the time, which is impossible for anybody. Um, but also just because I want to feel worthy of that name and sometimes I just, I don't feel worthy of it. And that's a very interesting. I mean, that could be a whole other episode. Yeah. But I, I, you know, since, since like sophomore year, I introduced myself as that 
um, I've introduced myself to that uh, as that to employ like possible employers. Um, really? That is my name um, on end credits for shows that I've worked on. And there's really only one period of my life since that moment that I didn't feel like Super Kate. And I actually only introduced myself as Kate. Now, occasionally when meeting some of the older community, like my grandparents' friends, it was a little easier to introduce myself as Kate instead of Super Kate. But I think out of respect, possibly. No. Yeah, yeah. And and knowing also that that is not what they're going to remember. I would rather have them, you know, it's just Kate. That's fine. Or they knew, they've known me from such a long time ago, but haven't, they've lost the thread. So I'm Kate, so-and-so's daughter, you know. Ah, oh, right. Now I've connected the thread again. Um so but, let's leave this yeah. conversation with two pieces of information. One, yes. if you're not Super Kate, who are you? What is your real name? <laughs> My real name is Ekaterina Slepichka. That's why I said earlier in the claw, I wasn't even going to try. <laughs> you have a very beautiful journey from start to finish because you are evolving every day and that we kind of tapped on that even in this conversation that we are always evolving uh, whether that's you have the mindset of becoming a better version of yourself or whatever, whatever thought or words that you use. Um, that's what happens when we make our changes intentional, purposeful, and we recognize our own purpose and value in this world. So with that being said by the host, I want you to tell our audience, give them something valuable, hope, inspiration, determination, a word of resilience. You've been through it all. Give them something, please. We all have our own stories. And we, I believe they should all get an opportunity to be heard because that is what connects us. And I'm lucky enough to have platforms like this to share my story. I'm lucky enough to know people who want to know my story. And there's always going to be people out there who don't get the opportunity to really share what's deep in their heart and what they're going through because that's just not where their life is lined up at the moment. But we have the opportunity to give each other the space because of this big world that we're connected in, to give each other the space to share even a few nice words because you never really know how that's gonna change somebody's life. My parents didn't know that having those pictures up and talking about you know the world was gonna save me. I really do believe it saved me. Um, you know, they leaned into running a newspaper in a small town because they believed in community and building community. And in this day and age where we are, we are so global and it is often hard to have community we can lean into the small moments, both with ourselves and with others, having the empathy and compassion for other and for ourselves to be truly compassionate and, and just know that amazing, really amazing things can happen when we see each other and talk to each other from a from an open space of opportunity. How's <laughs> I love it. Then I need your help. If you know people who need to share their story, I want them on the Question God podcast. Until then, Absolutely. I want to thank you for this conversation. For those of you who are watching and listening. Thank you. you. Next time. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.